morning again. Uh, my name is Greta Harris, and I'm the co-chair of the commission who will be presiding over today's meeting. This is Monday, April 26, uh, 2021, and this is a meeting of the Virginia Redistricting Commission. I do want to remind members, staff, and other speakers on today's virtual meeting of a couple of items. First, please keep your microphones muted until you're ready to speak. This improves the quality of the audio for the meeting. Before you speak, remember to unmute yourself. And if not, we'll remind you. Also, please remember to state your name before speaking and especially before making a motion. This helps in our keeping a track of what is happening. Any votes that will be taken uh, today will be done by voice and by giving a hand signal. Additionally, uh, registration for the public comment period has closed. We do have individuals who have signed up to provide public comment. Such comment will be limited to two minutes. Um, I also note that members of the public who wish to comment on an agenda item may also do so by sending in an email to varedist at dls.virginia.gov. The comment will be posted on the division's website, which is redistricting.dls.virginia.gov. Again, for members of the public who would like to comment on today's meeting, the email address is V-A-R-E-D-I-S-T at dls.virginia.gov. Um, and so at this point, I would love uh, for either Claire or Amigo, I'm not sure who's going to do it, to call the roll call, and then we'll get started um, with our agenda. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? I was having sound difficulties. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Brinio? Here. Mr. Feliciano? Here. Here. Mr. Gilliam? Present. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mr. Hutchins? Present. Mr. Kumar? Here. Delegate Adams? Here. Senator Barker? Present. Senator Locke? Here. Senator McDougal? Delegate McQuinn? Present. Senator Newman? Here. Delegate Ransom? Here. Delegate Simon? Present. Miss Babachinko? Here. Miss Harris? Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, today um, is an exciting day for us. Uh, we will have an opportunity um, on our agenda to um, uh, go deeper on the uh, pre recorded redistricting training. Uh, we will be forming uh, two subcommittees, and then we will go into the public comment period. Um, I would uh, be open to accepting a motion to accept the agenda as presented. I move that the agenda be uh, accepted. A second. This is Sean Kumar. And we have a, a, a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of uh, accepting the agenda as presented, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, any abstentions? Okay. The agenda um, uh, stands. So um, I, am, I am hopeful that every uh, commission member had the opportunity to uh, review uh, the redistricting 101 training um, that was really well done. And um, I don't know, is Meg? Yeah, Meg is on the, the, the call today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really great overview. And my cats were personally mesmerized by your cat uh, during the recording. Um, and um, uh, it was, I, I think, very good. Um, it probably presented more questions for me than, you know, uh, which I think is par for the course. But I would open it up to other commission members 
uh, who might have questions after reviewing that video. Everybody followed every piece of information that Meg presented. Wow, you are really good, Meg. Okay, yeah. sorry, Sean. There you go. But yeah. Mr. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I know it probably wasn't maybe the topic of the video. Um, and as we get deeper into, I know that was a high-level overview, but uh, I'm you know eager to understand at some point in the near future. Um, and, and I know it was at a high level encapsulated in what you provided, and it was helpful. Is just kind of what are what are our options, right? Our exact left and right limits, so to speak, of um, you know what, what we can use. I mean, on one extreme, you might have, uh, and I know there's multiple layers. I mean, this is a very complex issue, as you stated, with constitutional law, state law, precedent. Uh, you know, on one on one spectrum, I suppose we could maybe, like you mentioned, including the the incumbents' addresses. Uh, one solution, on one end of the spectrum, we could not account for that at all, probably within the law, um, or even create districts from scratch without regard to how they are right now uh, at all. And there might be some really good arguments to not do that. On the other hand, you know, we can just minorly tweak what's already there, accounting fully for where incumbents live in the current districts. And so you know, just layering within that, I guess, our options, and at some point we're gonna to have to choose the criteria we'll wanna use um, regardless of what the census data is gonna show. Uh, and, and, and that may be something that takes us a long time to get to. Um, and, and this training, I think, was just the opening part, but I guess, um, you know, our path towards getting there, I suppose, is something of interest um, and, and probably something that the public will wanna comment on quite a bit. I think you touched on a really important um, question, Mr. Kumar. Uh, the reality of with redistricting is, you know, we do sort of have these um, guidelines that you follow, but then how you're going to follow those, like which order, how are you going to give order of precedence, that type of thing. It's really going to be up to you all to have some tough conversations and decide, you know, we do have a body of law um, in the Code of Virginia that's like, this is the criteria, but I mean, that's something that you all are going to want to think about when we talk about the, the population deviation permitted. That's a decision this commission will need to make. Um, you know, what deviation would you permit for a House of Delegates districts? Which deviation would you permit for Senate districts? Um, same with communities of interest. I'm deciding, you know, how are you going to determine what a community of interest is, how much uh, respect you will give for those, um, a number of decisions that will be, there will be sort of nitty gritty details that you're going to have to get into. Um, and I think that'll be the important work of the commission to do as we get closer and closer to the redistricting process so that when we do get that data, some of those tougher conversations and decisions have been made. And so we're able to start drawing as soon as possible, given that we have such a short time period. Madam Chair. Y yes. Who Senator Barker. Okay, Senator Barker. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think John's hit on uh, something that's you know critical to this whole process here. Um, and, uh, you know, what we have to do, I think, is to start with what is in the Constitution, uh, then what's in the code, and then uh, come up with what we want to uh, do uh, that could be adjustments uh, on various things and address other issues that are not specified um, in either the Constitution or the code. But I think those are things that we clearly have to be uh, paying a lot of attention to as we move through the process. And we did uh, last year uh, pass uh, a criteria bill that uh, goes uh, is much more specific than what we had had previously um, over there because there really was no criteria bill, that not criteria code section. There was a, what was in the, the Constitution, but it was pretty limited uh, just in terms of uh, compactness and uh, contiguity. Uh, so I think that uh, this the challenge we have is to make sure that we are doing what we are supposed to do, because uh, otherwise it's going to end up in court somewhere, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's the body of work that will be unfolding, and I think, um, honestly, I, I, I know it's going to be using up a lot more of our time, but I'm grateful a little bit for the, the delay in the census information. It gives us, as a commission, more time um, 
to learn together, to build relationships with each other. And ultimately, if we start with the Constitution and then the Virginia Code, and hopefully we will determine prioritized values uh, to help guide us as we make those tough decisions when the data comes in later on this year. Are there other? Yes. Delegate Simon here. Um, I guess sort of building on on what on Sean's question and Senator Barker's response, my own question, and I, mean, I have a question, maybe a suggested answer for it. So let me do set it up that way. Um, the, the question sort of was, you know, how do we start the process? I mean, I think maybe members of the public um, thought that we would all sort of be huddling together in one room together around the computer, punching stuff in together. And say, all right, let's start with a line here and a line there. Or is the staff going to sort of be tasked with giving us the place to start and then we start moving the lines? Um, so I, I'm a little just questioning sort of the mechanics of what literally is step one, right? Um, and, and and how that's going to work. I know in the past, um, you know, somebody like Senator Barker uh, would, would kind of do that for his caucus, right? He'd, he'd sort of grab the data together. He'd lay out a draft based on what was there. Um, we're not allowed to do that anymore, right? Everything we're doing is supposed to be done in public. Uh, and so my, I think we probably need to have some conversation about who we're going to task. Uh, if it's a, you know, we're talking about subcommittees a little bit later, but who specifically is going to be tasked with, with sort of the first rough draft of the map that we're going to play with, or whether that's a collaborative project that we do as a group of 16. Um, and my suggestion, maybe, for a way to handle that. And, and it goes to some of the other two things that we just that are on our agenda. I know that in 2011, there was a contest that was held. We had the universities go out and, and 13 different university groups of students kind of came up and applied the criteria at the time. And they had a bunch of maps. So, I, you know, to get us some more publicity, to generate some interest, some public engagement, um, and maybe to answer the question about hiring lawyers, maybe it makes sense to solicit uh, from universities, from the, the different caucuses, from advocates for one side or the other, uh, solicit draft maps. And we use that as a starting spot. I know I'm, I hate to sort of free form like this in a public meeting. I usually like to have these conversations, but it's all supposed to be done in public. So I'm just giving you guys my thoughts as I'm thinking them because I haven't had conversations with anybody um, beforehand. So I'm trying to be as literally as transparent as possible. But anyway, that's my reaction to those, those, those questions. Because I've been wondering the same thing, Sean. And George about how we're gonna you know, start this process, and I thought it might be nice to have uh, some sort of a contest or something, or, or or pick a day where we ask people, hey, what would you do? How would you draw the maps? And, and that gives us a, a lot of ideas to look at. So, mm -hmm. with that, I'll yield the floor. All right, thank you, uh, Delicate Simon. Um, so, Meg, do you have uh, a, a response to some of these general comments? So, I, I think you know. So a good point has been brought up about how you all plan to organize this work. Um, and I think that we would encourage you all to um, sort of start thinking about that now and how do you want to, are you going to sort of break up into groups and will there be a group that's responsible for congressional maps and a group that's responsible for House of Delegates maps? And then once you understand or you all have decided how you're going to actually approach the work, then we'll be able to get into the decisions about are we going to bring someone in one day to just sit there and doodle, you know, draw on the maps. Um, it's a really, it's a, an interesting learning experience. I will tell you when you actually get to sit down with the software and start moving, you know, um, precincts and counties and cities around. Um, so making those types of decisions. And then of course, deciding how we can receive public input um, and then actually incorporate those types of things into map drawing as well. So I, I know that today you're going to be introducing subcommittee proposals that aren't about the map drawing process, but perhaps something to think about um, as we go forward would be something similar. I, I think that's fine. And I, I do believe that the subcommittees will be able to go deeper in their respective charges and, and we may end up creating something more on the map drawing. Um, that's an engaging idea, um, Senator uh, Delegate Simon, around just ways to um, uh, both educate and uh, connect with citizens um, um, because we want this to be uh, an inclusive process so that all Virginians feel good about the end result, uh, if that's possible as a goal that we have. Um, so, 
Um, I think we'll continue to evolve um, how we're going to work together as a commission. We knew that um, it, at the beginning, we were just organizing ourselves. I think today's agenda helps to put another uh, foundation block in that organization of the commission. And we're continuing to train many of us, myself included, who really need to um, deepen our understanding of the legal and uh, philosophical goals of a redistricting commission. And I think that will continue on through May. Um, and sometime thereafter, maybe we're in a better position to really begin um, looking at uh, how we are going to address the, the map drawing process, um, which will be iterative, I, I would imagine, uh, on several occasions. Also, just note, Ms. Harris, um, that at our next meeting, we'll have someone pre presenting sort of a general overview of what the mechanics of redistricting look like to kind of give you the opportunity to see, you know, what does that screen look like when you're using the software? And then we do plan on having um, someone from our software vendor come and give a really in-depth walkthrough of the software um, and you know, the programs that you'll be using. So I think that might also help you all decide how to organize this work if there's someone who shows a particular affinity to the to the technical nitty gritty drawing stuff, um, you know, allowing those types of people to sort of take the lead, that type of thing, but. All right, thank you. And Mr. Kumar? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, building on on, on, on your comments and those of, of our um, co-commissioner so far, I mean, just one possible suggestion is uh, if we're able to, you know, we've got, we've got certain limits required by the constitution and the code as Senator Barker said, um, I'm open to the competition idea, but but before we ever even start playing with maps, and in this sense, perhaps it's a blessing that, as you said, we won't have the census data for a bit, because if we start with a, a deeper dive into what we must do based on the law, right, and, and a lot of it's kind of what we can't do, then there's discretion, as Meg said, right, we've got some things we can choose about, we can decide if we're going to prioritize certain factors, if we are able, and I'm not saying we have to or we need to, but if we're able to come to some sort of an agreement um, or consensus about at least some or a lot of that before we start playing with maps, I, whether we have a competition, whether we draw it ourselves, it, the question then becomes, okay, we've made these assumptions or we've made these decisions on policy of what we're going to try to favor. Does this fit? And it, it, it maybe protects the purity of the process as opposed to, well, I really like this map and how can I argue whether or not it fits? It's like we've got something, a litmus test, and there might be a number of maps, of course, that are going to fit that mold. Um, but then we're also kind of, no one can really say we did it with any end mind, end map in mind um, is, is one suggestion. And, and that's not necessarily going to be an easy road, but it might be worth doing that at some point before we start playing with the maps or get the data. Yeah, um, it, it almost uh, depoliticizes the process if we have our values uh, sort of agreed to before the data comes in. It, it makes that process honestly pure um, for the end results. Um, so I think if we go through a couple of more sessions and that should take us through May, I believe, I, I don't have that full training schedule up in front of me right now, but to have the, the individual who, who does map drawing and, and then we have a more in-depth uh, map drawing uh, presentation, all of that is just helping to educate us as, a, as one body and then I think we'll, we're in a better position to really talk about um, the values and the policies that we want to adhere to uh, as, as the data starts coming in. Um, so let me just look across the screen. Are there other comments or reactions to the training um, that Meg presented to us? Okay. Well, Meg, thank you so much for that. And I think this process um, that uh, the, the DLS team and, and McKinsey and I were, were bouncing around to try to preserve as much time for dialogue during our commission meetings and having the trainings where appropriate uh, pre-recorded um, just saves everyone's time. And so that um, 
as we we go deeper into this year, we'll have more time together to be able to wrestle with some of the um, the more difficult and more challenging um, aspects of our work. Okay, well, um, well, if there are no more uh, comments on uh, the training, we'll move on. And there is one comment in the chat um, because we uh, we are committed to ensuring that the public knows um, everything that is in the chat because they can't see it. Um, and Senator McDougal just apologized because his job, uh, he had a job commitment um, uh, for being a little tardy joining us, but we're happy that you're here. Uh, the next agenda item is the proposal to create two subcommittees. Um, and the purpose of that is so that we can um, really go deeper um, and sort of divide and conquer um, the, the, the critical work that needs to be done by our commission. Um, the, the subcommittees will be uh, working in their areas of focus and then bringing back um, recommendations to the full commission for review and approval. Um, it was an interesting process that McKinsey and I and um, the DLS staff went through in trying to have balance between each uh, subcommittee. Um, each subcommittee will be consisting of eight voting members um, that include four legislators representing House and Senate majority and minority parties and four citizen members representing the majority and minority leadership appointees. Um, the two subcommittees, um, and again, this is up for discussion and we'd love to hear uh, feedback. Um, the first one is the budget and finance subcommittee um, that would develop and recommend a commission budget. Um, I think at our last meeting, we got an overview of the two-year allocation that we have from the state, but how we will um, spend that money um, will be uh, the work of this subcommittee. And then to develop and administer a procurement process for uh, consultants that the commission may deem necessary that we want to, to bring in uh, with our body of work that we'll be doing this year, um, including legal counsel uh, as we get closer to the actual map drawing. So in general, that's what we're hoping that the budget and finance subcommittee uh, will be charged with um, um, doing on behalf of the commission. The second um, subcommittee is citizen engagement. And here we are hoping that this group will develop and recommend an advertising plan for meetings and public hearings. Um, last meeting, we, we started talking about whether or not um, uh, we were going to have uh, our website um, around uh, uh, having different languages so that um, as the demographics of our Commonwealth continue to evolve, that, that all citizens will be able to understand and uh, participate in this process. Um, additionally, um, the Citizen Engagement Subcommittee will develop and recommend a public hearing schedule, um, which is exciting and still has some question marks associated with it because we're still in the middle of a global pandemic, whether they will be in person, whether they will be virtual, where they will be around the Commonwealth and, and how we want to engage with citizens um, and, and to garner their feedback. So um, let me um, read out um, our recommended membership um, um, groups for the subcommittee. And I think McKinsey and I were reaching out to as many people as we could. We got to most folks, but maybe not all. Um, for the budget and finance subcommittee, um, we have asked uh, the following two individuals to be co-chairs. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Marvin Gilliam um, and also Mr. Sean Kumar for the Budget and Finance Subcommittee. In addition to those two individuals, uh, uh, Mackenzie Babachinko, uh, Senator George Barker, myself, Greta Harris, 
Senator Newman, Delegate Ransom, and Delegate Simon will be on the Budget and Finance Subcommittee. On the Citizen Engagement Subcommittee, we have asked um, the following two individuals to be co-chairs, uh, James uh, Abrinio and also Richard Harrell. Um, in addition to those two individuals, we're asking Delegate Adams, uh, Jose Feliciano, Brandon Hutchins, Senator Locke, Senator McDougal, and Delegate McQuinn to be on the Citizen Engagement Subcommittee. And with that, I will um, open it up for questions or responses and um, or if someone is having uh, some heartburn on their subcommittee assignment, um, this would be the time to, to let us know. Man, you guys are an easy group to work with here. <laughs> um, we, Madam Chair? Yes, yes. Since, since there was a pause, I, I hate to speak twice here, but um, I, I just I, I think I would note just for folks that I, I suspect, like the rest of our meetings, these are open to anyone who wants to come and attend. And so even non-subcommittee members would be free to attend as many of both meetings as they wanted to. Uh, and weigh in. And um, you know, this just sort of focuses the voting group and, and, and it gives us a little, it helps us um, not all be spread so thin if we don't want to. Am I accurate in, in my sort of assumptions about this? Absolutely, uh, Delegate Simon. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And additionally, um, we had, uh, in forming these subcommittees, we said that they would also be open to the public. Um, and I would love to hear feedback in, in lieu of having verbal comments at the subcommittee level that citizens could provide written comments and then have the opportunity at our full commission meetings to be able to, to give uh, verbal comments if they so desired and would love to know uh, commission members reaction to that type of structure. We, we have full, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Locke, there you go. Thank you. Okay, do we know um, how soon uh, subcommittees will start their meetings? That's a great question. And uh, we, we definitely were trying to, uh, would, would love to see the subcommittees meet on alternate weeks to the full commission meetings. Um, but I think we would put that responsibility on the co-chairs to sort of uh, organize themselves with the help of the DLS staff that can send out doodle polls and help scheduling. That That is probably the most challenging thing we, that we have right now is just uh, everyone has really busy schedules and trying to uh, find time where the majority of members can can meet and and be able to begin their work at the subcommittee level. But we were hoping that maybe as early as next week, which may be unrealistic, um, just given how busy everyone is that we could get organized. But I, I'm looking at Claire, I would think that uh, if the two uh, co-chairs could meet uh, today or tomorrow and then uh, give Claire some guidance. She could send out a doodle for the rest of the members of a subcommittee to try to see if, uh, by some alignment of the stars, we could get some dates on the calendar. Um, Madam Chair, I can reach out to the co-chairs after this meeting and send an email, get available dates, and then try to send a poll out to see where we're at. I think that would be helpful. Um, yeah. And I think as, as, as much as we can be flexible with our schedules to try to get these on the calendar uh, would be, be helpful. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, yes. Delegate McQuinn. Uh, are we expecting the subcommittees to have a quorum for votes and then uh, um, are we going to be allowed proxy in case you cannot and get one of the other members uh, is there a procedurally what what's in place for those committees, subcommittees? 
I don't know. Um, do you have a recommendation um, as no. to how what what you think would be a, a fair and just way to operate the subcommittees? Uh, it, no, not at this point. I'm just asking in terms of uh, for voting purposes, because okay. uh, I assume that we will have some of that responsibility as well as subcommittees. So. I mean, I, Oh, I'm just asking. Yeah. Okay. So for the subcommittees, again, um, while they will be voting on recommendations um, from that subcommittee, they're going to be bringing um, actual their their agreed upon recommendations back to the full commission for approval. But I would imagine that we would need at least the majority of we would have to have it if it's eight. Um, at least five members there at any given time, but I'm open to other suggestions that uh, people would have so that we give guidelines uh, so that everybody knows um, how to operate. So that would be one thing, what, what constitutes a quorum. And then secondly, would we allow proxies to sit into the subcommittee or not? Those would be the two questions I'd put out to commission members. Any thoughts Here. from folks? Senator Barker. Yes, Senator Barker. Yes. Yeah, uh, generally, I mean, what in the General Assembly and, and in public meetings, uh, you would have to have a, a majority of the committee members uh, directly participating. And so that would, uh, sub, uh, that would be five of the eight, at least five of the eight would be uh, involved in the meeting. Um, when we have in-person meetings, you have to have at least a majority that are there at the meeting. Others can participate remotely, but um, in many instances, but uh, they would have to be five of the, you could not count one of the persons who is uh, uh, remote uh, participating as part of the, uh, part of the core of them. Okay. Well, since more than likely for the next I don't know, at least few meetings, maybe a few months, we're going to be doing everything virtually. Um, I, I would imagine if we have a total of five participants, then the subcommittee work could, could move forward and that would constitute a quorum or Meg. Yes. So I, I did want to jump in. Um, technically, we do have a definition of quorum for the entire committee or the entire commission. So in theory, you could think about sort of mimicking that quorum definition for subcommittees just to kind of keep everything on the same page. Okay. Um, so what we do for your commission meetings, a quorum is a majority of the legislative commissioners and a majority of the citizen commissioners um, constitutes a quorum. So perhaps you could mirror something like that. So you couldn't just have five all the leg legislative commissioners and then one citizen commissioner and then a decision gets made. Okay, so it would need to be three and three to constitute a quorum, three citizens and three um, legislative representatives to constitute a quorum for a subcommittee. Right, so you all have four legislative commissioners and four citizen commissioners on each subcommittee, right? It's, yes, okay. Um, that sounds um, good to me, um, and the scheduling is going to be challenging, but we'll, uh, I'm, I'm sure that everyone is committed to trying to, to make as many meetings as possible. But uh, how do people feel about that? Um, three citizens, three legislative representatives uh, equate to a quorum for our subcommittees. Madam Chair, uh, I, I think that sounds fine and ideal, I guess we could address it now or just if it comes up, if, if, if it becomes challenging to obtain times that would work for that many people, another option, if, if staff says it's okay under the, under the rules, could be that since a lot of this is to, to, to kind of do work and have discussion, um, you know, time with staff, that um, we could maybe have a rule that, that that three out of four of each type of member is required to take a vote on anything, but to meet and have discussion and do some work, maybe we could we could lessen that as, as one proposal. Mm -hmm. And that's a great suggestion. Um, Ms. Lamb, if we are just working and learning and clarifying, but not voting on something, is it okay for the subcommittee to continue that body of work? 
So I'll defer to our parliamentarians in the group. Um, my understanding is that as long as we're not taking a vote on a specific action, quorum isn't required. But I know we've got some rules nerds in this group, so I'll let um, Delegate Simon. Okay, Delegate, <laughs> Delegate Simon, I see your hand up. I, I I think Meg was subtweeting me a little bit until the end where she, where she added me for speaking in Twitter ease. Anyway, uh, no, I, mean, I think, frankly, I'm not particularly concerned uh, with the quorum requirement, as Sean was saying. I mean, the subcommittees aren't going to have the, I, I don't think, the authority to do anything binding anyway, as I understood this, the, the proposal, mm-hmm. that whatever comes up at a subcommittee meeting ultimately has to be approved by the full commission at a full meeting right. that meets all the quorum requirements and so forth. So, even if you did, for whatever reason, have an outsized number of, of legislators at a meeting and not enough citizen rep- representation, I don't think you defeat the purpose of the, 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 the commission because ultimately those citizens are going to have an opportunity to see that final proposal, that work product, and vote on it before it becomes effective. So I, that's why I was sort of quiet about the whole, you know, what constitutes a quorum. I, I don't think, frankly, it matters a whole lot. Um, and, you know, maybe there's an argument to be made that we don't even need to have quorum requirements uh, since you know the the the, the, adv- the role is advisory uh, anyway. Well, uh, we're we're going to be encouraging commission members to try to participate as much as they can in the subcommittees because we think that that's where um, deeper work will occur and and will continue to to clarify you know our. Um, the, the recommendations that will come back to the full commission for how we're going to operate here. So, so we'll, we'll give it a shot. And I think this is um, an evolving process and we're again, being very transparent with the public, you know, we'll, we'll try some things and if it doesn't work and it needs refinement, we'll be open for that as well. So, so in, in general, uh, again, just to recap, we have our co-chairs for each subcommittee. We have our membership for each subcommittee. For right now, a quorum will constitute three citizen and three legislative representatives uh, for uh, voting purposes uh, with the subcommittee recommendations to the full commission and um Anyone who wants to come to a subcommittee meeting will will make uh, those links available. Um, but for voting purposes, for recommendations that will be lifted up, um, it's only the members of the subcommittee. Let's see. Um, is there anything else that people have comment on or cl- need clarity on for the subcommittee formation and operation? Madam Chair, uh, Delegate Adams here. Yes, sir. I would just say, uh, just on that last point for the uh, subcommittee chairs, I think it, 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 even if we if we get to the point where we need that extra flexibility, I think that'd be fine, according to what uh, Delegate Simon has said. But uh, but I do think we should strive to sort of mimic the quorum rule, you know, um, just in terms of um, f- following what uh, sort of the intent is on the overall commission um, and uh, and we just would suggest that for the chairs that, that we certainly try not to, uh, to to make every effort to have uh, committee schedules where we can keep that um, keep that balance between uh, between the commission members I, I couldn't agree with you more delegate Adams and um, uh, again this year um, you know we're, we're asking all commission members to be as flexible and adaptable with their work schedules to try to attend as many of these meetings as, as possible. Um, I, I'm, I think we this gets us started um, and then Ms. Waters will be reaching out to each of the co-chair subcommittee co-chairs after this meeting. We'll get some beginning dates. And please be on the lookout in your emails for polling data that will happen over the next day or so to try to schedule those meetings. But all commission uh, members will get the dates of the subcommittees so that you have the option to participate if you want to. Okay. Um, Let me just, one other point of clarity. Um, uh, Ms. Babachinko and myself, uh, when we were talking with the DLS staff, 
Um, again, um, are very much committed to transparency. And so the subcommittee meetings will be open to the public, but we will not receive verbal comments from the public at the subcommittee level. People can come, they can provide written comments to the website. Um, and then um, if it's something pressing, they can always come to a commission me meeting and, and sign up to speak on the subcommittee issue that they may have um, uh, interest in. Are people okay with that structure? Okay, I'm seeing a few heads shaking, so. Yes, we'll Madam Chair. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you, uh, Delegate McQuinn. So I, we'll, we'll try that, and again, um, uh, again, we're adaptive, and, and so if we need to make refinements in the future, we will. So um, I, I do want to, uh, so I think we're good on the subcommittees, and boy, we're really uh, moving along on the agenda today, um, and I think we are prepared to move forward with the public comment period, I believe. Um, we have, um, I wanted to thank the DLS staff for making some changes to um, the commission's website. I think uh, there was some confusion in previous meetings where people were just registering to attend our meeting. Um, and um, by accident, they signed up to speak. Um, and so we were having like 30 people signed up to speak and it really wasn't that many. Um, and so now on the website, it makes it, um, you have to be very intentional if you have a desire <laughs> to speak at one of our commission meetings um, and it makes it easier just to sign up to, to be able to listen in. So um, we have nine individuals who have, registered um, by our deadline, which was yesterday. Uh, we still are limiting um, the comments to two minutes, and I think Ms. Capers will be uh, monitoring the time. Um, and again, we encourage people um, uh, who are interested in our body of work this year to also uh, consider making written comments uh, to our website um, um, or you can send an email with your comments to v-a-r-e-d-i-s-t at dls.virginia.gov. And with that, um, we will go to our first uh, citizen comment individual who has signed up, and that is Mr. Ken Chasen. If he is available, Ms. Capers, if you could let him in, please. Mr. Chasen? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, good morning. Good morning. My name is Ken Chasen, and I live in Charlottesville. I'm a retired information technology professional, and my areas of expertise are business intelligence solutions and data analysis. I would like to propose a strategy for redrawing Virginia's congressional district maps based on a hub and spoke architecture where the hubs are Virginia's 25 most populated counties and the spokes are adjacent smaller populated counties. This map drawing strategy is modeled after how the Virginia Association of Counties and Regions is organized, which currently has 13 designated state regions and a subset of all existing Virginia counties. Virginia's 25 most populated counties represent significant communities of interest and place and account for two thirds of Virginia's total population. These counties can be used as the hubs or focal points for any new congressional districts because that is where most people live in Virginia 
the highest concentration of schools exist, the highest concentration of jobs and industries exist, where most major shopping centers are located, where many major religious centers are located, and further, they provide a wide array of government products and services to their residents in neighboring small counties, such as police, courts, utilities, election polling locations, and libraries. Each district hub will have attached to it adjacent smaller populated counties going out in a wider ox until a congressional district population of 1 11th of the total state population is achieved. Candidate adjacent counties must satisfy the following criteria, directly border on the congressional district hub and or each other to be in compliance with the contiguous rule and further should have similar demographics such as race and ethnicity, industries and occupations, urban, rural breakdown, and education. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jason. We appreciate your comments. Our next speaker is Patrick Hughes. Madam Chair, it's um, Shea Capers. He's not here. Um, we only have two additional attendees um, that register for public comment, and they are Aaron Corbett and Stephen Martin. Okay, and Stephen. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Ms. Capers. Um, we have, uh, is Mr. Martin on board? Can we let him in? Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, you may have to unmute yourself. There we go. There I am. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I don't really feel like I need to do the public uh, speaking part. I submitted the written comments, and I my only concern, generally speaking, is that the districts be made as compact as humanly possible, giving consideration to natural boundaries of mountains, rivers, and um, other geographic considerations, um, and that the effort be made to preserve all of the um, uh, political jurisdictions of towns, counties, cities, and not divide them up. So that I think as a general matter, people's community of interests will be preserved. Because I think the commonality of school districts, police forces, voting districts locally uh, will um, ensure that the representation for those people will be relatively uh, uniform and com uh, common to the interest of the people in the areas that are designated for the district. Um, I certainly hope also that the spirit and, law and legal requirements for not having any uh, political considerations uh, will be uh, followed to the T uh, so that we can be sure that we are picking our representatives rather than representatives picking their constituents. So I thank you for your time and your effort. I'm very much excited about the fact that after many years of participating in the both litigation and political area on redistricting. We're finally moving ahead. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. We appreciate your comments. And then um, uh, Erin Corbett, please, if we could let um, her in, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for giving me the time again to speak. Um, as I have said before on these meetings, uh, my name is Erin, and I work with the Virginia Civic Engagement Table, which is um, in which I help facilitate a coalition where we can help gather comments from different organizations and the communities uh, that these organizations serve. So I would just like to read some of the comments that they have provided me. Um, firstly, I know that there was a reference to the chat feature that's used in Zoom. So I just want to flag that Zoom chats can always be saved um, just to make that easier. And then also for those Zoom chats to then be made accessible and open to the public. We also want to really strongly encourage that the commission uh, both solicit and review citizen and community drawn maps. This is something that's really important to our coalition and to many of the communities that we serve. And then uh, to the point about subcommittees receiving either verbal and or written comments, we really encourage not only that these subcommittee meetings be public, but also that they allow verbal comments. And then lastly, um, given the fact that I think this is, you know, several meetings that we've had that have allowed public comments that we're really appreciative of, but I would love to ask the commission how and when it plans to respond to public comment questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments, Ms. Corbett. And I just want to confirm with Ms. Capers that we don't have anyone else signed up to speak. Madam Chair, yes, we do. We have Christine DeRosa. Okay. Um, Ms. DeRosa, if you could please um, begin your comments. Good morning. Good morning. My name, my name is Chris DeRosa. I am one of the co-coordinators of the Redistricting Issues Committee of the League of Women Voters of Virginia. The League has long supported a fair, nonpartisan, transparent redistricting process. We encourage all Virginians to participate. As such, we are hosting a redistricting information session this Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. as part of the National League's Redistricting Day of Action. All Virginians, including the members of this commission and DLS staff, are invited to join at this virtual event. To ensure full transparency, the League suggests three simple things that will assure the public that you are operating in full sunshine. And I see that one of our requests has been uh, granted. You are appearing in gallery view. We are very pleased that we are able to see all of you and not just a few of the speakers. Uh, second, as Ms. Corbett just uh, suggested, please publish the chats on the DLS website. And third, we suggest that the commission provide closed captioning during meetings to reach Virginians who are currently unable to access your meetings. Next, the League encourages the Commission to take advantage of the extra time you've been granted due to the census delay. Please schedule public hearings beginning in early summer rather than waiting until July and August. Remember to publicize the hearings widely in different languages and with timely notice to the public so they have time to prepare for their appearance. We recommend that these hearings be held in person as well as virtually and in all regions of the Commonwealth. Many Virginians may prefer to testify in person, especially those who may lack access to reliable internet and technology. And finally, the League suggests that the Commission devote a portion of every meeting to discussion, ask questions, respond to citizens' questions and comments. Yes, this may require extending your meetings beyond the scheduled two hours, but we think that it would be valuable as for you and for the public as you work towards the drawing of fair maps. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate your interest and uh, input. Ms. Capers, is there anyone else that is uh, signed up to speak? No, ma'am. Okay. So uh, to Mr. Wade, um, while we made some progress on um, the sign up for uh, speaking and uh, attendance to our commission meetings, we may need to continue to 
refine that uh, um, so that people are, are, are doing what they intended. They're either attending our meetings or they're very clear on their desire to speak as well. But we're, we're getting there. Um, Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. We, we, we had changed it to um, specifically state that um, to ask the question, do you intend to make live public comment? And if you do not intend, do not register. Um, so we can um, we can continue to um, it gets better with each meeting. So we will work on that to make sure that we uh, um, be as efficient as possible. Thank you. The staff is doing a great job and, and we just appreciate the, your, your flexibility and ongoing help to, to get better and better. I, I think, um, and I don't know if Ms. Lamb is still um, on or Mr. Wade, a question that I have, um, uh, it is um, challenging to hear comments from citizens who are interested in our body of work and not to respond um, or to engage in conversation with people to make sure that we as commissioners fully understand what is being recommended um, um, and, and to just bring clarity here. Um, so are, do you have any counsel or advice to the commission on uh, given the FOIA uh, guardrails that we're working within, how we might be able to have more uh, engaging conversations with citizens who are um, taking their time and, and, and showing their interest in the redistricting process? Well, I think, Madam Chair, that um, the, uh, the way that the legislation is written, written is looking for that interaction in the context of a public hearing. Um, and, and I think as we work with the subcommittees to get those, um, if you will, listening tours scheduled, you can have more of that give and take with all the members being involved. Um, um, and I'm going to, Meg wants to, wants to add in to it, but um, I think that that's what we were looking for, kind of shuttling people to those public hearings so that they can be more of an interaction in a more transparent atmosphere where everyone is, is involved. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wade. And, and I was just going to ask the members of the General Assembly who are on this commission to maybe speak up if they have any thoughts, um, since they are often in committee meetings with members of the public who are um, trying to engage with them and how you know they would recommend um, you all being able to engage, but not getting any back and forth dialogue with every public commenter. Okay. And Delegate Simon has his hand up. Yes, sir. So, Madam Chair, just reacting to that a little bit. I think it's worth, and I think uh, Amigo kind of said it, I think it's worth distinguishing between public comment and a public hearing. Um, and I think if we set up some, some meetings that are designed specifically to be a public hearing, there can be an opportunity uh, for, for some back and forth. The danger of back and forth is, um, there's a couple. One, um, witnesses, we don't want to be cross-examined essentially by the witnesses that are coming to speak to us, right? And so when there's an invitation to engage, um, it's not necessarily appropriate for, for those. And we had that happen, as, as Senator McDougall will remember, uh, to one of our judges um, who, who is who's going back and forth on what should have been a public comment about her judgeship. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit risky. I think typically they're deferring to the chair. I guess the last thing I'll say about it. The chair is usually responsible for sort of controlling that and how much back and forth they want to allow. Um, it's sort of a prerogative of the chairman uh, to say, you know, to folks, this is going to be public comment, so it's, we're in listening mode only. Versus, uh, or, or you can some, sometimes just take a chair's prerogative and say, "Hey, that is a really interesting point. It sounds like something that's maybe worth expanding on for all those of us that are members of the group." I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and, and, and open that up to a little bit wider discussion. That's that's mm -hmm. typically how it's handled. I think to, to Meg's point in in our legislative hearings, you sort of establish the the, the basic rule at the beginning. And then the chair is allowed to deviate from that. I don't think any of that, frankly, implicates FOIA, though, unless I'm missing anything. I think it's mostly a, a meeting management um, issue more than a FOIA issue. Okay. All right. And in the chat, we have a uh, commission member Hutchins says that he has a question. And yes, um, Mr. Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Simon may have touched on it. I was trying to find the button to raise my hand, uh, and I did. <laughs> but uh, 
I, I do have uh, some concerns. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Corbett, uh, for one, um, she was asking about questions or how we would go about answering questions from the community. You know, I'll tell you, when I got involved with this commission, I fully expected to leverage the, expert, the, the expertise and experience of those within the community. But based off of that meeting, uh, which we discussed for you, I was a little, uh, I got a little scared at the end of that, you know, about, you know, because it, it made me feel like I couldn't talk to anyone. That's first. Second, that next commenter, Christine DeRosa. Um, these virtual forums, I think that these are fine learning opportunities for us, for, for those of us that don't know so much about this process. It seems like there are quite a few people within the community that do. Um, and I would like to leverage that. So is there any rule against us attending these forums and maybe not speaking? Or do we just stay away from them completely? I'd, I'd really like to know the answer. Thank you. Um. Ms. Lamb, do you have an answer for Mr. Hutchins? I think it is acceptable to attend forums, hearings, redistricting panels. Um, I think I would just caution to consider what your involvement um, is and looks like, given the rule that we have about um, not engaging with uh, people outside of this a public commission meeting um, on matters of redistricting and reapportionment. Thank you so I do think that this, the work of the citizen engagement subcommittee is going to be really important um, because uh, they will be really crafting um, the structure of when, where, and how we will conduct public hearings around the Commonwealth and um, and probably have some rules of engagement of how uh, commission members can engage back and forth with citizens. And I agree with you, um, Mr. Hutchins. Um, we do want to leverage uh, experts out in the field who really have been thinking deeply about redistricting and, and those who um, are interested in um, this process. And so figuring out how we can do this um, um, in a transparent way and, and, and stay within the legal boundaries um, that we need to uh, is going to be important. So I think um, if we give the subcommittee a, a little bit of time that I am hopeful that they'll bring back recommendations that will be useful and be more um, fulfilling to both citizens and commission members for, for that type of uh, um, equitable exchange. Um, we are finishing up quite a bit earlier than we had predicted. Um, and so um, are there other items or, or things that we should uh, uh, consider before we get ready to adjourn? I would say that one of the comments that I think the uh, Ms. DeRosa made around closed caption um, is something that we'll go back and um, consider uh, because we are working on the website to be able to offer multiple languages on that. And the closed caption would, would make a lot of sense to do that as well. So a, a lot of the recommendations are really spot on and it's, um, we just ask the, uh, the general public to give us a little bit of time as we're continuing to um, uh, further our organization and to get stronger as a commission. So if there, there aren't other comments, um, our next meeting will be Monday, May 10th at 10 a.m. Um, and um, we do, uh, there we'll have an introduction to the mechanics of redistricting and I guess map drawing that will be um, actually pretty exciting. And there's one other um, comment uh, from Delegate um, Simon saying the public stream is closed caption. So is, I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Wade, is that indeed true? Yes, man. We um, we uh, use the uh, Senate um, um, platform, and I believe that is closed caption. But we can we can confirm that. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's the collective uh, we, you know, so everybody contributing and, and makes us better. So with that, um, I, I just want to thank everyone for your attendance and for the public comment contributions. And we will look forward to uh, seeing everyone in a couple of weeks. And please check your email um, from um, outreach from Ms. Waters to try to get our subcommittee scheduled. And everyone have a great day. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.